Blessed Sunday to everyone, especially those who are watching right now. I'm Chris Capulso, season pastor of the First Baptist Church of Manchester, bringing you another message from the Word of God. Our scripture reading for today is Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Before we, we move on, let us pray. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for giving us another opportunity to listen to your word and learn from your son, Jesus Christ. Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit and straighten our path and let us walk in this life according to your will. Let your mighty power be displayed again through your word today that we may appreciate more of the things you have planned for us. All glory and praises to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the uh, saddest things I heard in recent days was the uh, passing of my high school classmate because of COVID-19. He's a very bubbly person, full of hope, I believe. And at the age of 45, he's got more to give to his young wife and kids. For the uh, family he left behind, it seems that all hope vanished into thin air. They are absolutely in despair. I, I thought that was the saddest story for me um, this past week. Not until I was told by my wife that an acquaintance of hers committed suicide. The victim was smart, very young, and highly educated. I've read countless stories about despondency these past few months and I I think there is nothing quite as devastating as hopeless life. Experts say that the number the number one reason why people commit suicide is depression and the uh, contributory factors include one loss of a loved one Number two, persistent feelings of failure or shame. And uh, number three, adverse experiences like trauma, abuse, or bullying. There are people today who are helpless and uh, don't be surprised. Many of them, many of them are even self-professed believers but they feel empty inside i've heard one say i don't feel the presence of the lord chris for them their, their current situation is like is like a living hell there is no hope they are in misery and there is no prospect of getting better it's, it's just a difficult way to live life. I completely agree that life can be a living hell for many people when you do not find hope. That is the reason why it is so important for us to come home or to come to the Word of God. It is so important for us to come to the Scriptures because the Bible is a book of hope it is a book of hope the bible tells us about jesus and the abounding hope he gave for mankind paul says may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the holy spirit 
In a hopeless world today, we can find hope because we worship a God of hope. But before we proceed to the real meaning of Jesus being the God of hope, we should remember that there are three major graces in the Bible. Three major graces in the Bible. They are faith, that's number one, and then love, and third one is hope. As written in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. These three are called major graces because they are God-given. It did not originate from men. Faith, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, is given by the Holy Spirit. Love, as written in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, is from God. So, where did hope come from? Both John and Peter explained in 1 John 5, 13 to 14, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 6, that hope comes from Jesus Christ. Hope comes from Jesus Christ. These three graces were given by the same Holy Spirit, the same Lord, and the same God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, meaning the three are from the same source. The same source. Now, question is, what exactly is hope? What is hope in the Bible? When we talk about hope in this world, we generally refer to it as wishful thinking. It's like saying, I hope you get well, or I hope I pass the exam. Hope, therefore, by world standard, is a desire for something good in the future, the thing in the future that we desire. And the basis or reason for thinking that our desire may indeed be fulfilled. In short, it is something that is not definite, fixed, or 100% sure. That is why it is called wishful hope or wishful thinking. But if we examine the Bible carefully, the hope that is given by God is definite. It is definite. It is fixed. It is 100% sure it will happen. It is not wishful hope or wishful thinking. The biblical understanding of hope is a certain confident expectation. When we examine faith, it is a grace looking up towards God. The reason is that faith is God's divine persuasion. Is this in the Greek text? When we talk about love, it is about looking around us. The way to love God is to love others, even our enemies. Meanwhile, hope is that forward dimension where we look ahead. Biblical hope not only desires something good for the future, it expects it to happen. And it not only expects it to happen, it is confident that it will surely happen. That is the biblical hope. Now, God wants us to have a confident expectation of everything good that is promised in Jesus Christ. Notice that this hope is rooted and founded in Jesus, nothing else. It says in Romans 15 verse 12, preceding the text that we are looking at right now, again Isaiah says, There shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, 
In Him shall the Gentiles hope. In Him meaning Jesus Christ. The Gentiles refer to you and me who are not Jews. And the Bible is saying the world can hope in Jesus Christ. We have hope in Jesus Christ. So the hope of the Bible is rooted in Jesus. Why? Because through Jesus' death, we were saved from the penalty of our transgressions since he nullified the law covenant, the law covenant that he made with the people of Israel, and in doing so, enforced the better covenant, the grace covenant, which God swore to himself. Listen to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. You say, how did God swear to himself when he made the grace covenant with Abraham. Just a brief explanation. If you read Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 and 17, you will know that Abraham was sleeping when God passed between the pieces of carcasses. Abraham did not pass between the dead animals, and so it was God alone who made the covenant to himself in order to save the believers. God in the Old Testament made the covenant, made the promise that he will save his people and that he will multiply them. He will multiply them. God in the Old Testament made that covenant and all of these he swore to himself since he passed between the carcasses to seal the better covenant and this is our hope the hope is the confident expectation of all the good that is promised by jesus and he inaugurated this better covenant by the shedding of his own blood on the cross and the story did not end there for after three days after three days he rose again to show us that like him there is hope that we Christians shall also arise from the grave in the Lord's appointed time that is the promise of hope that will surely happen it is not a wishful thinking, nor it is a wishful hope, but it will surely happen. Let's read another text about the biblical hope. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 to 12. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and the things that accompany salvation through, for though we are speaking in this way, for God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Until the end. So that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The text is very clear. What God gave us is a full assurance of hope. This is the hope which is fully assured, hope which is confident, hope that has moral certainty in it. In fact, verse 12 implies that hope and faith are almost synonymous. Notice the connection. 
verse 11 says, Go hard after full assurance of hope. Verse 12 says, The result of that pursuit of hope is that you will be like those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Examining the text, the promise that God gave the believers the full assurance of hope is sealed in the future. It is sealed when Jesus comes back with the clouds. Jesus did not promise that if we believe in Him, we will be blessed with good health, we will acquire wealth and fortune today. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. He didn't say that we will get whatever we want in life here on this wicked world if we believe in Him. No. That is not hope at all. To prove this point, let me read to you Romans chapter 8, verses 24 to 25. And it says, For in this hope we were saved. Listen to this. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. Let me repeat. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. There you go. The hope that God promised is far better than the things we see today. And what are those things that we should expect in the near future from our Almighty God? I'll share with you five specific things, but in no particular order, okay? Five specific things. Number one, um, let's go to John, the book of John, chapter 10, verse 28 and it says and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand when Jesus comes back we will be clothed with immortality and we will never die again we will have glorified bodies that will never get tired nor will get sick. This glorified body will have flesh and bones, but it is not bound to corruption. It will not decay. Imagine a body that can get through walls and can travel instantly to any point in the universe without the use of any vehicles. If that is the case, we will have no use for yacht, for luxury cars, or private planes. All of the hosts are going to be useless in the future. Useless. Let me give you another one. Number number two. Um, let's go to Romans chapter 8 uh, verses 19 to 21. So let's read Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 21. And it says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In the future, the earth shall be set free from the bondage of corruption. Wow! There will be a new earth and this new world in the future will be free from sin 
free from the wicked men and free from the devil, Christians will have nothing to worry about. All right? Everything as in everything good will be provided by God. Nothing for us to worry about. That's number two. Now let's go to number three. Let's go to Revelation. And uh, Revelation chapter 21 verse 3. And it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. God promises He will return and live among us. What it means is that Christians will see Jesus face to face will hear his voice every single day and there will be great rejoicing for our Lord our King will be with us for eternity forever see God face to face in the future will be the happiest and the greatest moment of my life that will truly complete me I hope you're just as excited as I am number four okay um, let's go to Psalm chapter 16 verse 11 Psalm 16 11 you make known to me the path of life in your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever. Wow. As God will dwell among His people, there is the assurance that we will all experience the fullness of joy. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for this will be the things of the past things of the past it's going to be like a celebration every single day in the presence of our God for eternity for eternity forever eternal joy everlasting joy number five James chapter 1 verse 12 and it says blessed is the one who perseveres under the trial because having stood the test that person that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him for those who are going to endure trials for those who are patiently waiting for the hope promised by God, there will be rewards for all of us. And the rewards will not be like trophies that we receive when we join competitions. Trophies that will eventually corrode as time passes by. We will not receive those kind of trophies trophies but a crown the rewards are going to be crowns like the crown of life which will be given to those who love God the best thing about this reward is that nobody can take this away from us nobody can steal this from us now compare these things from the teachings of the prosperity preachers the prosperity gospel is wrong not because not because it promises too much the prosperity gospel is wrong because it promises too little too little 
it is exchanging something of infinite worth and something that is touching like wealth and good health in this age. And when Christians drink in that, and if they set their hopes on money and health, they don't have the true engine of the Christian life. This is not the hope being taught in the Bible since hope that is seen in the scriptures is not hope at all. It is not hope at all. The forward-looking confident expectation of all the good, supreme, glorious, infinite good promised by God that, my friend, is biblical hope. Having said this, some of you might scratch your head and say, how can this message encourage us when this hope you are talking about is in the future? What has it got to do with me today? Well, good question. Well, first and foremost, God wants you to have hope today, although it's it's in the future. God wants you to have that hope today. That's His will. That's what Paul's pray. Uh, that's what Paul prays for for the Christians. Now, the other reason why this passage about hope is important is because this hope impacts the way you and I live today. The hope about tomorrow impacts the way we live our lives today. Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. The joy and peace of a Christian are not separated from as early as you learn about Jesus Christ and His grace covenant, we should already be rejoicing for our future is sealed, is secured. Look, others are probably chasing for joy in every other thing. Women, money, careers, but it is all in vain. It is all in vain. There is no joy in this. Why? It's Only the man whose future is secured can truly rejoice for his hope. For his hope is in God who is faithful to his promises. He is the God that can If he promises something, he is surely going to do it. What does that mean? It means that when a man goes through pain, he can rejoice. Absolutely, he can rejoice. It means that when he goes through catastrophes, he can rejoice. Crazy? No. Why? Because he has a source of joy that is independent of the world that is around him. There is a source of joy from within because there is an assurance. It's like telling him he is insured and assured of all the good, the good things in the future. There is nothing to worry about. This is not strange for Paul himself said in Romans chapter 12 verse 12 rejoice in hope be patient in tribulation be constant in prayer <laughs> a strange mix of terms right but it is true and practical rejoice in hope be patient in tribulation be constant in prayer the apostle Peter said that as Christians, 
we should expect suffering to come our way. It's automatic because we are not of this world. We are set apart from the world. And so expect opposition, expect persecution. And so our message today is not about telling you guys to believe in Jesus, to believe in God, and your sickness will be gone. Or your financial problems will be solved. Just claim it. No. That is not our message today. That is not the hope we are preaching that's laying promises. I pray that we can have hope in this darkest hour and say to ourselves that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I pray that that is our mentality in facing the world. This hope does not only allow us to live in joy and peace. This hope allows us to have the motivation to change our life, to sanctify our life. So, since we know that Jesus Christ is surely coming back, we should get ready. And how do we get ready? Let's go to 1 John chapter 3 verse 3. And he says, and it says, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Let me repeat. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him, meaning Jesus Christ, purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. What do you do when you are expecting a very important visitor, a VIP, coming in your place? What do you do? Of course, you will clean up, right? You want to make sure everything is in order and, and you have the best clothes to wear to impress the VIP, right? As Christians, since we know that the most important person in heaven and on earth is coming soon we should put our lives in order to we should get ready and clean up we have Christian friends who passed away recently and I saw firsthand the power of hope the bereaved family took the passing of their loved ones to thank and praise the Lord for he has promoted these faithful Christians in heaven our home my dear brethren we are just pilgrims in this world our home is is not the United States of America it's not the Philippines it's not China home is where God is. As a closing, I have good news and bad news. Bad news, Christians will continue to experience difficulties and sufferings. Again, Christians will continue to experience difficulties and sufferings. That's really bad. And it's written in the Bible. The good news, all of the things happening right now are just temporary. That's the good news. So, Let's not be weary and so anxious of our lives. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 
chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. May we all find these texts comforting in these trying times. And I pray that we all find that full assurance of hope which is in God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your amazing grace that set us free from the bondage of sin, of our self-righteousness. Thank you for the hope you have given us, Lord. We ask you, Father, that everyone who hears this message today will find true rest for their soul and trust you in everything because our future is well secured. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us wisdom that we may now exchange this worldly hope to the biblical hope that is surely coming. All glory and praises to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.